So welcome to this session. This is the Political Ecology of a Basic Income in Canada, um, part two. This is a conversation across the political spectrum. When Andrew introduced the idea of doing political ecology this morning, he talked about the fact that there are so many different actors in this system and how important it is to understand that. Um, so we today are going to have perspectives from academia, government, and media. My name is Sheila Regeer. I'm the chair of the Basic Income Canada Network, um, but right now all I'm doing is housekeeping. Um, so this session is brought to you by basic income organizations in Canada and the United States, and we're really grateful to our American partners for doing so much work to, to make this all possible, and uh, to the sponsors who have um, supported generously to make this happen as well. The Gerald Huff Foundation for Humanity, Humanity Forward Foundation, Aid Kit, and Steady. If you'd like to submit a question in Crowdcast, the forum we're using, there is a question, there is a little line at the bottom that says, ask a question. So you can also in there, you can vote on questions so that if there's something you really like, you can bump it up in the order. Um, Next, there's a chat box that some of you have already started to use. I found throughout this, um, throughout the conference that the chat box has been really lively and people have really good comments and interesting things to say. So please chat away, but if it really is a question um, for the panelists, put it in the ask a question box. Um, so that's the administrative things taken care of, and I'm now going to turn the session over to Lori Monsa Bratton um, for her conversation with Trish and Jennifer. I've known Lori for years. She's a star, has been a wonderful ally to us, so I'm really looking forward to this session. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila, and um, we'll get started with uh, our speakers. So the speakers for this session today are Jennifer Robson, and she is an Associate Professor of Political Management at Carleton University. She has two decades of experience in Canadian social policy, first in government, then the nonprofit sector, and now in academia. She's advised Canadian governments on income support, tax policy, and more and continues to collaborate with nonprofit groups serving low income and vulnerable Canadians. Trish Altas is a Green Party member of the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island. She is a community-based researcher whose work has involved exploring lived experiences and collaborating with government departments, community organizations, and vulnerable populations. Trish was elected to represent District 23, Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke in April 2019, uh, and she serves as the opposition critic for economic growth, tourism, and culture. Trish chaired the provincial government's special committee on poverty that in 2020 came forward with a costed recommendations for a basic income for PEI. And I am Laurie Monson-Bratton, your moderator for the session. I'm a former social justice reporter at the Toronto Star, where I wrote about poverty, inequality, social programs, including welfare, childcare, children's aid, and disability rights. I've also written about affordable housing, basic income, and the plight of low-wage precarious workers. I retired in the summer of 2020 after almost 40 years at the Star, where my work received three citations of merit for the Michener Award for Public Service Journalism. So let's get started. Three Canadian provinces and one territory led by a variety of political parties, have or are seriously considering implementing a basic income for their residents. In central Canada, the Ontario Liberal government in 2017 introduced a three-year pilot project involving more than 6,000 residents in three communities. On the West Coast, British Columbia's NDP government in 2018 appointed an expert panel to study a basic income for that province. In Eastern Canada, Prince Edward Island's progressive conservative government in 2019 struck an all party special legislative committee to come up with a fully costed plan to bring basic income to Prince Edward Island. And finally, the indigenous government of Nunavut 
is currently working on a basic income for its residents in the north. So in Canada, we have recent examples of how basic income has appeal for all political parties in all parts of the country, including the north, where the indigenous government of Nunavut has no political parties. So it sounds like something's happening. But I think, as our panelists will tell us, it's not all as it seems. So we're going to get started with Trish. How did a conservative government in your province end up striking this all party special committee of the Legislative Assembly to come up with a poverty measure for PEI, a living wage, and a plan to implement a fully costed basic income? Right. Well, thank you so much for that introduction and uh, hello to everyone uh, who's joining this afternoon. It's uh, it's lovely to be able to uh, to engage in this conversation with you. And I really appreciate the opportunity to to join you here today. Um, so uh, the story of how um, the basic income uh, discussions on PEI have uh, has evolved over the years. Um, it's 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 been an ongoing um, process. So. Um, before the well before the special committee on poverty was struck, um, there was actually a motion put forward um, by uh, by our party, by the Green Party, and I will say, of course, that this uh, anything I say today will be through my perspective as a Green Party member of the official opposition of Prince Edward Island. So I must declare that bias right up front, but just to uh, to be clear on that, but. Before I was elected in 2019, uh, it was put forward a motion in the legislature, non-binding motion, uh, to uh, for the PEI government to advocate with the federal government for a basic income guarantee for Prince Edward Island, and that motion passed unanimously. However, at that time, um, there was uh, a letter sent to the federal minister from the PEI government, and that was sort of where the conversation ended. So. Um, when we were, uh, when there was an election in 2019 and a change of government uh, to, as you mentioned, the progressive conservatives were elected in a minority government situation with our caucus as the official opposition. We then put forward another motion to strike a special committee on poverty that would look at uh, three key areas. So we, uh, the committee was um, tasked with identifying um, what is a living wage for Prince Edward Island, uh, what would be a definition of poverty for Prince Edward Island, uh, and lastly, um, uh, putting forward fully costed recommendations for a basic income guarantee. So that committee met several times. We spoke with um, experts across the country on basic income, as well as many different not-for-profits and community organizations working with individuals who have experienced poverty on Prince Edward Island to come up with fully costed recommendations that are really a starting point um, uh, to develop um, a full basic income program, as well as guiding principles for what a basic income should look like on Prince Edward Island. So that's sort of been how it how it's developed. Um, all three parties in the legislature have um, did vote in support of that final report of the basic income, or sorry, of the um, special committee on poverty. So there has been um, support across the political spectrum. Uh, at this point, we are still again now in a waiting stage. So we do hope that discussions with the federal government are ongoing and are waiting for further updates from um, our government here in Prince Edward Island on, on what next steps could be. Great, well, I'm, I'm still amazed at the all party uh, endorsement of, of this idea. It, 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 it bodes well, I guess, uh, but I, I guess we're still waiting for the federal government to, to, to join in. Um, Jennifer, on, on the West Coast, you worked uh, on the BC expert panel on basic income, uh, which was struck by an NDP government in that province. Uh, can you tell us why the panel recommended against BI and how politics might have played a role there? Sure. Um, so uh, just to, um, uh, for context, and, and thank you very much for the question and, and for the invitation to be here today. So just for context, um, there was a, a three-person expert panel appointed, and I was part of a larger group of researchers who were contributing to the work of that panel. Um, the full report and all those research papers are available at uh, bcbasicincomepanel.ca. Uh, and I strongly encourage uh, interested people who might be um, in the audience today to go and take a look at, at the work that is there. Um, you know, including there's like great data sets and they have online visualization tools and you can play around, like basically kind of design your own basic income and see what it see what it would look like. 
Um, and they made 65 recommendations in total, one of which was to recommend against a pilot for basic income. So the panel was tasked with kind of three questions. Um, is it worth uh, doing a pilot? Um, what kind of pilot would you, um, uh, would you envisage, if so? And um, uh, the third, I'm sorry, I am actually blanking on the third, but it had to do with essentially, uh, you know, kind of what, uh, what scope do you see for immediate changes to existing programs? Something along that lines, uh, something along those lines. And so this, um, this panel was created as part of uh, what we in Canada call a confidence and supply motion in the provincial parliament. So following the 2017 provincial election, um, the ND provincial NDP held the most seats, but not enough to have a majority. So they cut a deal with the provincial Greens. Um, and one of the conditions that the provincial Greens asked for was the, striking this panel to do the exploratory and feasibility uh, work of uh, a basic income in the, um, uh, in the province. Um, and so I guess I'm not, I'm not privy to the negotiations and the machinations that took place behind the scenes of that conference and supply motion. Um, I don't know if this was one that was uh, kind of extracted unwillingly from the provincial uh, NDP. I can say I was in a few day long meetings where uh, both the NDP minister and the leader of the Greens attended. Um, and um, I think it was clear they were both actively engaged. Uh, they were informed. I would say my impression was, and I don't think that this is unfair to say this now, that the Provincial Greens uh, representative was certainly um, a more active advocate for the concept of, of basic income, whereas the minister, uh, you know, was, was actively engaged and participating in the conversation, but maybe wasn't quite as, uh, as an enthusiastic advocate. Anyway, fast forward to 2020, there's another provincial election, and this time the NDP wins a majority, does not need a confidence and supply motion. Um, and the BC Basic Income Panel had already shared an interim uh, version of their report. It's now, of course, public. Um, and, uh, you know, the many of the recommendations, you know, 65 in total, are still sitting there waiting uh, for, for action. So I think some of the um, politics here, obviously, we might be able to conclude that without sort of the driving force of an opposition party uh, able to kind of um, force the hand of a government, um, that that might be part of the explanation. Um, I would say, though, that uh, there's probably other factors. I mean, let's not forget, we've also had a pandemic <laughs> and a recession. Um, so there's been a few other demands on governments uh, in the last couple of years. I think as well that any government of any political stripe that um, was taking a serious look at the report of the BC Basic Income Panel would have said, look, this isn't easy to do, right? Um, you know, to get the poverty reduction impacts that we want, the BC Basic Income Panel figured it would be about $37 billion. Um, so to get about an 80 to 90 percent uh, reduction in, in poverty in the province, we're looking at about 37 billion dollars, which is like several orders of magnitude more than the provincial budget. So there was that sort of issue of haven't figured out how we're going to pay for this. Um, and then the other list of, you know, 65 recommendations are really, I think, an important um, list of recommendations for program change, for social assistance reform, for better collaboration on um, tax and transfers with the federal government. And none of these is necessarily an easy lift. So I think it's still sitting there waiting uh, for the, the BC NDP. Um, I don't have a good read as to why they haven't taken action on that now. Um, I remain hopeful because there, there are some really good ideas in there. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I think uh, you, you've really shown us how the, the, the political um, strength of a government, um, how I think both PEI and now we, NDP, the, uh, the NDP in, uh, in, in uh, BC were in a minority situation, and that seemed to be the, the catalyst um, behind uh, these um, efforts on both, both ends of the uh, uh, coast of the, of the, of the country. Um, Trish, what role do you think the media plays in, in, in shaping these political views um, uh, to, towards a basic income? I, I can remember uh, reporting in Ontario um, uh, 
being very much in favor of a basic income after uh, Doug Ford's progressive conservatives uh, gained power in 2018 and killed the, the liberal pilot project. And at the time, the media was very uh, critical of Ford for wasting the research uh, that the pilot project was gathering. Um, and yet, um, in 2020, when the BC panel's uh, report um, came out, the media then seemed to be supporting the findings that basic income is too expensive. I think that that big 37 billion number was was a, a headline and and uh, um, columnists were saying it's too expensive, too complicated, uh, you know, on to the next thing. Um, so I'm wondering, in 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 PEI, did, did the media play a role in in shaping that the all party uh, support for, for your report? What was was the media sort of cheering on that that let's get together and solve poverty in PEI. <laughs> Trish? Yeah, that is it's a really interesting question because I think um, one of the um, things that has been quite prominent in, in media coverage throughout this an entire uh, term of government of this government, I'd say would be this idea of collaboration. So the idea that all parties should be working together is something that I think our, the media has has uh, certainly promoted. Um, I think that here in PEI, we really do, I have seen some quite fair media coverage uh, um, from all different um, areas. Uh, and uh, did it have an impact on the all party support? Um, I think what had a bigger impact, to be honest, would be the grassroots movement around basic income that had been going on um, for years in Prince Edward Island, particularly, um, I'll acknowledge the work of the PEI Working Group for Livable Income, who had been advocating for several years uh, around this idea of a basic income, but also going out in communities, having small group conversations uh, and uh, engaging, engaging people around this idea of what a basic income, what the idea of it is, as well as what are the values that PEI would see um, as essential for a basic income in this province. And that work was also often covered by the media. So the idea of basic income was not um, something that was, was a new discussion on PEI when we brought it to the legislature. And um, I think um, I would have to give a lot of credit to to the those who have been who are working at, on that grassroots level to to bring the idea forward and start that discussion. Mm. It's interesting you talk about how the media was was covering these discussions, and and I think um, so often I I, I found um, certainly in Ontario uh, I think I think that the, the Liberals had had mentioned their intention of having a, a pilot project for a basic income you know several years before it, it actually was launched, and I I think for, for the first at least a good year, I was the only person reporting on it. <laughs> the, the, the other media seemed to be involved in other things and it almost seemed like some pie in the sky things. Who cares if there's all this work going on the ground uh, at the ground level? Um, there were other 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 uh, topics were of more interest. So uh, it's interesting how, how you noticed that the media was actually covering this and 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 cheering on some cooperation. I, I, I think that's pretty interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, could I add something very quickly yeah. to that? This will be very yeah. quick, but also here in PEI, we have a very uh, politically engaged population. So we have the highest voter turnout of, of any province. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the sort of the joke that politics is PEI's, you know, most favorite non-contact sport. So people really do pay attention to what's happening and the media reflects that interest in the public as well. Very interesting. Uh, Jennifer, um, the BC panel recommended targeting um, a BI to specific groups. I think you mentioned such as people with disabilities. Um, and I think you also uh, suggested that um, the panel um, said that many of the existing current programs could be made more basic income like and wondering if, if you see some room for agreement or progress on, on those fronts in Canada. Uh, yeah. Yeah, on my more optimistic days, yeah, I sure do. Um, look, the BC Basic Income Panel took a look at the existing supports, and oh my goodness, uh, there were there are a lot, right? And it's really complex. And on the one hand, that complexity means that we have currently stuff that is um, 
meant to help, for example, women fleeing domestic abuse in a different way and meeting their needs differently because they have different needs than, for example, single employable adults who are dealing with um, substance abuse issues or, you know, like, so when you take that intersectional lens and you see the complexity in the current system, you sort of go like, oh, okay, I understand how we got here, even if how we got here is now really messy. You know, and they, they did the comparison to imagine a house that has been renovated over and over again by different handy people who never talk to each other. And so you've got like, you know, you've got plumbing that doesn't really line up and you've got a bit of knob and tube over in this room. And anyway, it's all kind of a mess. And um, so they basically were recommending, and, and I saw this in some of the, the research that I did for the panel as well, um, that there are that there are kind of elements of low hanging fruit in our current system that would make a meaningful difference in the lives of low income Canadians, um, and would have the benefit of bringing greater simplicity and coordination across those various systems of income support and access to services as well, because that's an important part of this conversation too, right? We, I don't think anybody. Um, believes that a cash, well, I think a very small number of people would say that a cash transfer would solve all, but that, you know, the vast majority of people who engage in serious conversations about basic income recognize that there still is an important need for access to other kinds of, of supports and services. So uh, when the panel took a look, um, they, you know, again, 65 different recommendations. I'll talk about two where I think they saw opportunities for early wins, right? Um, so think about, for example, um, income support serv uh, and services that we have in place right now for adults with disabilities, particularly those who are in provincial social assistance, which is a really important part of the caseload in virtually all provinces, uh, including PEI, and even in provinces where they don't have a separate program. Um, within their welfare systems for persons with disabilities. And this is one that is kind of ripe for turning into a basic income, right? This is a known population. We know that they are high needs. The rates of poverty are completely unacceptable. And it's a relatively stable population as well, right? Once you have a severe disability, like your leg after amputation is not going to grow back, right? Like, and so we don't need to have all of these ridiculous needs tests in place to verify this population and um, impose all of that administrative burden that we do. So that, that's kind of an area that would be uh, ripe for, for targeting uh, with uh, something more like a basic income. Another suggestion that they had would be, um, look, if, if we hope to use the tax system to be able to do income testing, for example, for um, a, a basic income that is geared to other sources of income or, or a negative income tax, like a, a refundable tax credit to actually deliver the, the, the support, um, then we really need to do something about the filing burden, especially for low income people. So um, work that I have done, I found uh, it's about roughly one in five uh, people who are living below the poverty line don't file a tax return. Um, once we get to people who are on social assistance, that climbs to about uh, one in three. So it, until and unless we kind of sort that issue out, whether it's through deemed filing or simplified filing, those kinds of things, that's an important part of the population that we would be missing out if we immediately shifted, right, to uh, something like a refundable tax credit basic income. And I actually think that those are two um, areas where there ought to be, at least intuitively, multi-party support right um you know right through from the conservatives liberals ndp and greens that um i noticed for example in the last uh, federal election there was multi-party support for the proposed uh, federal canada disability benefit in fact the you know the federal greens have been i think probably one of the best champions um alongside the the, uh, the minister who's in charge um and you know tax simplification my goodness this is something that i think across north america we've seen cross party support for so you know on, as i said on my more hopeful days i i see i see avenues for progress trish uh, from where you sit on the other uh, coast um uh where do you see the most room for agreement uh, and uh what what advice do you have for bi proponents the activists the academics the policy thinkers the politicians 
on how to keep ramping up the basic income movement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a great question. And again, I, I will I will turn to the um, collaboration and uh, working together with grassroots political um, the political uh, spectrum of you know all parties uh, you know researchers advocates you know what the more that we can all collaborate on this issue I definitely think that the better off we will be I think it really does come down to um, agreeing on sort of the core value of um, that everybody deserves to live with basic health and dignity and you know I think that's something that uh, across party lines I hope that we can all, um, agree that is is a worthwhile goal to work toward for Canada. Um, here in PEI, I think one of our greatest strengths strengths along that um, would be um, we have really close uh, close knit communities where um, uh, we do really care about each other in in a way that maybe doesn't happen across in in all areas of the country as much. And and uh, so the idea that um, you know that everybody would have enough to live well with basic health and, and, and wellness is is something that I think we all recognize we would like to see for our, our province or that is is well well a well supported idea here in, in PEI um, and I just I see a note in the in the comments there about grassroots so I would say um, you know those who are uh, working outside of the political spectrum outside of research um, to um, to bring forward this idea of a basic income in the community. So, you know, again, I'll, I'll speak about the Working Group for Livable Income that is is a collaboration, again, of, of all different types of organizations um, that are, are, are advocating on this issue. So, um, you know, it's never, it's not gonna, it's not just a political issue. It's not, you know, um, just a social issue. It is something that impact, impacts all of us. And, um, you know, the more broad engagement we can get on this, certainly the better. Well, broad engagement, that's a, a good call to, um, uh, to Sheila, who has been uh, monitoring the questions from our uh, uh, listeners today um, to uh, uh, tell us what, what's on the mind of, of, uh, of the audience. Do you have some questions uh, for, for the panelists, Sheila? I just have to find myself first. <laughs> now the questions. Yeah, I've been monitoring the, the chat too. So Trish, I'm really glad you, you answered that, that question around grassroots. I think that's something, you know, a few more of us need to think about. Our organization, for example, has been called alternatively um, a grassroots organization or just a bunch of academics. Um, and in fact, the movement includes so many different people from so many different walks of life. So I, that's an interesting discussion too. Um, also in the chat, I noticed, and I am going to get to the two real questions, um, I noticed there was some interest in some talk about how, you know, there's there's a right, a really right-wing extremist kind of view of some of this stuff that seems to be creeping into social media anyway and, and other places. So if anybody wants to address that, that would be great too. But I will read out the first question that comes from Sid. And it is, what are the political considerations in establishing an external panel and in selecting particular panel members? Mm -hmm. I think some of that was alluded to in the chat as well. Uh, Jennifer, you were privy to the external panel in BC. Um, how, do you know how they, what, what went into choosing those, those members? Um, well, so the three members are, uh, uh, very well respected uh, academics um, who have, you know, basically, yes, they're all economists. So, but let's not hold that against them. They were, they were also very much uh, interdisciplinary economists. Um, and um, I think what was important was that they, that we had somebody who was, you know, a, a labor economist. Uh, we had somebody who was an intersectional feminist economist who also does tax policy. And we had an economist who's done an awful lot on sort of, you know, tax and transfer design and that kind of thing. So the 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 expertise and also the fact that uh, um, these were academics who understood the literature, but had not been had their professional careers invested yet invested, I think, in the basic income literature. So they could approach this with fresh eyes. I think that probably made the panel more palatable 
um, across the political spectrum in terms of feeling like it, these are serious people who will do serious work and take a serious look at this as opposed to coming at it having already made up their minds. I guess the other way to think about the politics of an external panel is more from sort of a political management perspective. And so the other part of my day job is teaching people who want to work in politics. So maybe I can say a few words on that angle. Um, look, anytime you, you um, appoint as a sitting government that you appoint an external panel, to some extent, you are kicking the football down the field. You're buying yourself a bit of time before you have to make a decision. And you are also giving yourself plausible deniability. You're going to get a series of recommendations in a report. You have some opportunity then to cherry pick whatever it is that you like, right? And so the, the, the challenge, I think, from a political management perspective for a government is to appoint a panel that is uh, credible, right? Um, that will be, in, you know, kind of insulated from uh, criticisms of uh, being partisan or having everything pre-cooked while at the same time um, having confidence that they will give you something in their recommendations that you can work with at the end of the day, um, even if the end of the day is maybe longer than advocates might prefer. It's interesting. I, I see a question in the chat here. Um, did this expert panel have any um, co uh, public consultations uh, or did they just go away in their offices and do the numbers? No, I think that's yeah. a really important point is that process. So it's not only about who do you put on the panel and what time frame do you give them and what are you hoping for to get out of them. It's about also having clarity of the mandate that you give them, adequately resourcing them so they can actually do a serious job and ensuring that they're engaged in a process that is inclusive. Um, so it's important to hear from people with lived experience. It is important to do public consultations. It is important to hear from a wide diversity of voices. Um, and I think actually if, if people do have a chance to go and look at the, um, the, the, the website that was created to document all of their work and their findings, I, I think people would, would recognize that that was the case in, in BC. So they did do public consultations? Oh, they did. Okay. Um, just so the difference between the the external um, panel and in PEI was an all party uh, special legislative committee. Um, pros and cons to that, uh, Trish. Yes, so it was again a, a very yes a different process. So it was a um, a committee of the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island. So it involved um, two members from each party, uh, which is in and of itself an interesting thing uh, in uh, provincial uh, legislatures. As I understand that our committees are evenly balanced with all three parties elected uh, having equal representation. Um, but we didn't have an economist sitting or economist sitting in on the actual group that that finished the the paper. We were very fortunate to have um, uh, we worked with Harvey Stevens, who is an economist, to help us with the costing uh, and modeling of our basic income uh, guarantee based on the values. But it was a, a very different approach. Um, we also did not have. Um, consultation with individuals with lived experience directly. And this was actually um, a limitation of working, I would say, with um, a legislative committee, because our mechanism to engage on any issue is really um, public meetings that are streamed online and that anybody can come in and watch. Um, and uh, it's a fairly intimidating environment, to be honest, um, you know, it can be. So uh, it really, you know, to, um, to ask individuals, uh, particularly in a small province like Prince Edward Island, where you know everybody knows everybody else, to come and present publicly um, on their lived experiences of poverty um, was really we discussed this as a committee and did not feel that was the appropriate um, route. But it is so important that before any actual basic income would be implemented in PEI, that there would be engagement on um, on what. Uh, on that final stage before implementation with people in the community, including those with lived experience. And I would suggest that organizations um, that uh, work with individuals with lived experience or you know, researchers who have that experience working with, um, with uh, populations such as those living with, in poverty would be a, a, a better a mechanism to really have that meaningful engagement. 
This is really interesting that the process matters so much. I'm recalling some of the real strengths, I think, of the Ontario process, um, too, which to me seemed to do a, a pretty good job of balancing all of these sort of political perspectives and perceptions out in the public, um, actually working with basic income organizations as part of the consultations, um, you know, to make sure the information was there. Very interesting. Um, so yeah, process. Um, now let's take a little bit of a different tack. We've been talking about federal and provincial things. This next question is, have there been any successful basic income advocacy efforts in Canada at the municipal level? It seems that other than the Greens, Canadian provincial and federal parties are generally resistant or reluctant to advocate for basic income. Might BI advocacy find more ears and minds at the municipal, municipal level where candidates, councillors, mayors don't have the same kind of official party affiliations? And that's from Dennis in Manitoba. What do you think, Jennifer? Sorry, struggling for the unmute button. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, look, I think it's an interesting, uh, really interesting and thought-provoking question. I am, uh, I'm unfortunately not able to bring to mind the names of any particular municipal councillors um, or mayors that I'm aware of, but it, it, vaguely this seems to be the case that I have heard of some who are for basic income. Uh, perhaps, you know, Sheila and her network, or even you, Laurie, given your extensive reporting, would be um, uh, better able to remember places and names than I will right now. Um, but I think one challenge, right, is that even if, even if we do find strong support for this policy change at the municipal level, they are not resourced or empowered to take action. So municipalities as creatures of the province um, have the most limited uh, fiscal uh, frameworks in terms of choice and flexibility, while here in Ontario, for example, responsibility for the administration of income, provincial income supports through social assistance are downloaded to municipalities, policy authorities are not. And um, so I guess I would, I would be, um, concerned, I suppose, about um, a strategy that would raise expectations for action at an order of government that is not um, equipped or able to take steps. It's it's almost like what's happened in PEI, isn't it, Trish, that, that PEI wants to do it, but they haven't got the money, so they can't do it without Ottawa, right? Is it, is it sort of sort of like that? Well, I mean, uh, sort of. I mean, I think it, it is, you know, I really agree with Jennifer that the municipal governments really just don't have the uh, the capacity or jurisdiction to really implement a basic income. Um, in discussions here in PEI, I think one of the challenges um, in engaging municipalities in the past around this has been that they also, you know, perhaps don't, because of those reasons, because it's not necessarily within their jurisdiction, that um, they haven't always made the connection between the um, the well-being of, of those in their municipality and a basic income. So um, I think there is a real opportunity um, to engage municipalities on this and even having, you know, many municipalities across the country, in theory, you know, perhaps passing resolutions in support of a basic income, I think could be useful. Um, but they, yeah, in terms of having um, any municipality, I think, take the lead on, on the on a pilot or on a basic income, full implementation would be probably not the correct um, or even possible approach. But maybe I think you're suggesting um, engaging municipalities to become allies. I, I, I guess mm -hmm. might, might might be might be a route um, to, to to bring that because municipal politicians are closer to the people. They could, they might come with more clout uh, in their advocacy role. Uh, do you think, Sheila? <laughs> Well, it's interesting in the context of this conference, which is North American, because one of the strengths of what's happening on to the south of us in Canada is that there is this group called um, Mayors for Guaranteed Income. So the MGI group, <coughs> excuse me, is really, really strong. And there are a whole series, like, like dozens of 
pilots, small, limited, but pilots that are happening at a municipal level. Um, and like they recognize that they too, and they have different jurisdictional things. Like I don't think we can replicate this in Canada. Yeah, more yeah. income, yeah. But their they idea, but their idea I, I believe, having talked to some, um, their idea is not to assume municipal responsibility for basic income or to do a pilot wondering whether this is a good idea or not. It's to do a pilot to show that it works and to push the feds. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they state that quite clearly in, in you know, doing the pilots, but doing really, really good research. Like there are several organizations um, that are following and assisting the, the research on these pilots too. Um, different situation in Canada though. I could just add to that quickly. I mean, that's really one of the advantages as well of Prince Edward Island as a possible demonstration of what a basic income could be. Um, of course, we are Canada's smallest province, uh, you know, just over 150,000 uh, uh, population. Um, and having all three parties uh, state support for basic income, you don't run the, the risk of what happened in Ontario with the, a changing government um, dismantling the project, the pilot project is not a risk that um, would be run with a, a PEI project. So that's, there's great potential here. And I, I think that's what you recommended that, that PEI be the, the pilot for the country, right? That, that, you, that your committee was saying, look, we're all, we're, we can show the rest of the country kind of like what Quebec did with childcare many years ago. Yes, exactly. That this could be the the starting point for a, a full basic income for all of Canada, but it could start in PEI. Yeah, and doesn't seem as expensive to do it in a very small place. I mean, one hundred and fifty thousand people is. I, I think w w in Ontario's pilot project, um, one of the communities, Lindsay, the, the entire population was was part of the part of the pilot project, and that that's that was one of the, the genius of, of that plan is they had different populations um, in, in, in a, a very urban environment, Hamilton, Bradford, Brantford, and then uh, a Northern community with high indigenous population in Thunder Bay. And, and then you had the entire community of Lindsay to look at what the knock-on effect for a whole community of a basic income. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and as we saw, uh, the, 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 with, until the Ford government was elected, it was it was very doable in Ontario. So, um, oh, Sheila, yes. next question. I, I am going back to my administrator housekeeping role now. Oh. Um, and one of my jobs is timekeeping. And we are very close to the end. So I have just a couple of things to say about like what's coming next. Um, so I want to thank all of you so, so much. This was just amazing. And I think, you know, I think there's so much hopefulness in a lot of what you said, and it will really inform movement strategy um, as we look at our political ecology, as, you know, we as non-governmental organizations look at going forward. So thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone who has been in the chat and, and following along. This, the recording of this session through Crowdcast will be available as soon as this session is actually over using the same link that you, you used to get in. Um, the next session, uh, I think it's the, no, I think it comes, no, there's one series of sessions first and then a plenary. Um, and I hope you'll join our American colleagues there. It's called The Politics of Basic Income, The Strategy of Winning National Policy. So we're again moving in, in this, like moving from theory to practice the policy kind of thing. Um, policy strategists will discuss how we move forward to comprehensive direct cash policy at a federal level. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot in there that applies to Canada too. So you join us. The year's conference will close out with the plenary session, Rethinking Basic Income, Challenges to Universality and Uniformity of Payment. And that includes well-known Canadian Evelyn Forger. And then there will be closing conference remarks and as uh, as we've done throughout for other people who have been participating, um, there's, a so, there's a social space called Kumo space that people are welcome to join afterwards. 
And so, uh, you know, everybody who's still on board, check out the conference program, make sure you know what's next and join the sessions that interest you. Again, thank you so much.